Once we are saved, we are a saint. Let's pray. Lord, this is an amazing thought that we ourselves could be called a saint. Please teach us what this might mean today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you walked into the average Christian church in Australia and asked how many see themselves as a sinner saved by grace, I think almost everyone would raise their hands. But if then, then you turned around and asked them who sees themselves as a saint, well, probably just a few would raise their hands. I wonder what you would do. So of those two things, which is actually the most biblically accurate statement of us as a Christian? Does the Bible refer to believers as sinners or as saints? We turn to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1, the start of the letter of the Apostle Paul to Ephesus, and he says to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Well, when he writes to Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 he says to the church of God which is at Corinth to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus saints by calling with all who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ their Lord and ours. The overwhelming and consistent message of the New Testament is that we are all saints by the grace of God sanctified because we are in Christ Jesus. Every child of God is a saint because he's in Christ Jesus. Now, what does the word saint actually mean to you? Probably not much to the younger generation. I guess it's hardly ever heard these days. It might have fewer flavour from the Catholic Church. They have their saints. And there's generally a few extra special holy people and usually there's a miracle or two associated with them. But none of us normal people could be called one of these saints. So I guess it's best to look at the, what the Bible says a saint is then. And it's quite simple. A saint is someone who is set apart. Set apart by God. God himself is holy, holy, holy. That means he is set apart, and they repeat it three times. So it makes no mistake about him being really, really set apart because God is not common in any way. He is holy. And that includes the idea of, of wholeness in there. When something is sanctified, it is set apart for a purpose, and when something is holy, all of it, Every aspect is set apart. It's a saint. When people are newly married and setting up house, they often buy a special dinner set. And they'll take much pleasure out of choosing the most special set of plates and utensils which their budget can afford. And they may have even indeed inherited a valuable and a special family heirloom set. And this set will be busted out on the most special occasions when the most special guests are coming. And that's what it's like to be set apart for special purposes. That's the picture of us as saints. Set apart for the special purpose of kingdom building activities. Let's look at God's word to check that out. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That, and this is what it's for, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And you can see here the special purpose we've been set apart to proclaim the excellencies of God. And notice before that the description of the saint's character. A chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for his own possession. That's what saints are. All of these things. 
And so knowing these things should lead to a change in the way we live and the way we behave. But we do not change our behaviour to become saints. Rather, we are saints and our transformed identity empowers us to live a holy life. So a saint, someone set apart by the grace of God and sanctified. We need to talk about sanctified. That's a word not used very often in common language. And it's a Greek word, hagiosmos, and it refers to the process of being made holy. And there's two components to it. Uh, what we would call a positional aspect and also it's a process. So it's both. It's both where we stand before God in his eyes and it's also what we are becoming in this life. So when we come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, we are positionally sanctified. That means we're put in the position of now being a saint. Our identity is that of a saint. And we can now legitimately wear a t-shirt saying, we are a saint. But we are now also enrolled in a process. The process of being transformed over the rest of our lifetime into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Here's an analogy for you, like becoming a professional footy player. When the rookie signs up, he can then wear the official jumper. But it doesn't stop just there, does it? Because the rookie then gets stuck in with the training program, develops his skills, and hopefully grows as a player to become a senior player and makes a great contribution to his team. And so when you become a Christian, you get the team jersey, which is the garment of Christ's righteousness. That's the new position you have. But then you still have to go on and practice and learn so that you can wear that jersey to many victories in building God's kingdom. So you're then enrolled in the process. There's a very little word, in, which describes many aspects of that team jersey which the saints wear. You see, the logo for a Christian's journey should be in Christ. And there's a, just an amazing inheritance a saint has because... He or she is in Christ. We see some of those things in Ephesians chapter 1. We see a lot of things there actually. Verse 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. In fact, 40 times in the one book of Ephesians, references are made to either being in Christ or Christ in you. And for every verse throughout the Bible that talks about Christ being in you, 10 verses can be found that talk about you being in him. Let's look at some of them. From Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen. Verse 12, your hope lies in where? In, in Christ. And verse 13, you were included in Christ when? When you heard the word of truth. The challenge is to see that we are very clearly identified as saints in the Bible. We need to understand that. We need to see it. And we need to pray for one another as Paul did in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 1. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Hmm. So pray for one another that we can get this. And let's expand some more on what a saint is. Firstly, a saint, being a saint represents Christ's incredible work in redeeming us, in buying us from the slave market of sin. Our old self is replaced by something that didn't exist before him, didn't exist in him before. We are declared to be a new creation. There's some verses there which we won't look up, uh, but you can later on. This new life is the very life of Jesus Christ within us who believe. We've become one spirit with the Lord, and every day we are challenged to put on the new self. 
By faith we are able to live in the light of this true identity which we now have as believers, to live out who we really are in Christ Jesus. This being in Christ is a, a connection and the Apostle Paul talks about that connection that we now have with Jesus. Here are some ways we are identified with Christ. We are identified with Jesus in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his life, in his power and in his inheritance. And Paul lives out of those connections with Jesus Christ, this identity that he has in Christ, even though he, he does acknowledge that before this, he was the foremost of sinners. But his life now, he, so, he says what that's like in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. In other words, it worked. And Paul is now a new man as a result of Jesus Christ's life being implanted in him. And he shows that by making good moral choices in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's not partly new, he's not partly old, and neither are we partly in the light and partly in darkness. We're completely new creatures in him and sin's power over our lives is broken. But that doesn't mean we are sinless. No, no, because sin still attracts us and hangs around us in our, in our habits and our desires. But it's a bit different now because the, the old us is crucified and sin's power is broken. And we see that in Romans chapter 6. And we're now under no obligation to give in to those sinful desires and habits. We don't have to serve, obey or respond to sin. Or well, even though sin is constantly calling out that it's just what you need, just what you need to feel good, or this will make you happy. But that's a lie. It's a lie. Sin is constantly trying to sell you its benefits, but it will never tell you what it's going to cost you. It conceals the cost. And any, indeed, anything which claims to give you satisfaction or an identity or a purpose in life which might be against God or ignores God is lying. And sooner or later, it will want to collect the bill for giving you its product. We need to be grounded deeply in the conviction that who we are in God is the correct foundation for all of life how we see ourselves in Christ, the type of person we think we are in Christ determines so much of how we live. It influences our attitudes, it influences our responses, influences our reactions to what life throws at us. On the whole, you see, we behave in line with the type of person that we think we are. If in your belief system you see yourself as inadequate or no good, you will likely live that out. And repeated defeats in the life of Christians are capitalised on by Satan. He pours on the guilt. And there's many other negative influences which pour on the guilt, particularly those who think, oh, if you're not perfect, you're, you're, you're out of it. You have to follow the rules. And these forces can cause Christians to question their salvation or even just accept as normal an up and down roller coaster spiritual existence. If your struggles with sin often overwhelm you, you could consider yourself just a sinner saved by grace, just barely hanging on by your fingernails until the rapture, and you might not think that you really deserve to get to heaven, and you'd just be grateful if you could just sneak inside the door of heaven and hide behind a pot plant. But this attitude would be missing the knowledge of who you are in Christ, a saint. Praise God, you are no longer just a product of your past. You are God's child and you are a saint and it can become a joy to cooperate with him 
in his transforming work in your life. You know that God's work of atonement in changing sinners to saints was Jesus' greatest accomplishment on earth. And that's what happened at the moment you got saved. And then the effect of this change carries on throughout the rest of a believer's life and that's called the work of sanctification. But nevertheless, we need to believe that we are new creations and we need to accept that the divine power of the Holy Spirit is within us. We need to lean into Jesus, to lean upon Jesus, to listen to what he teaches and tells us through the Bible and through other Christians, through the Holy Spirit, through Christian writings. We need to lean on our identity in Christ. And that means exploring what we have in Jesus. Just as a pro footy player would go and check out his new locker and then he'd go to the wander around the team, the team rooms and then game by game he'd be exploring what it's like in the away team rooms and he'd find out what the club's fans are like and what the management's like and what other responsibilities he has away from the game. In the same way, we need to explore everything we have in Christ and take it out for a spin. We want to find out what we're entitled to think about ourselves now that we are believers, now that we are in Christ. We want to do the things we are now entitled to do. We don't need to do them in order to gain God's approval, for we have already have that through our repentance and our turning to the Lord and our trusting him in faith. But rather, we want to be an obedient doer of the word because we've learned who we are in Christ. Did you know that the Bible nowhere refers to believers as sinners? Not even as sinners saved by grace? Before they become believers, they are sinners. But not after they become believers, they are now saints. If a true Christian accepts the idea of himself as a sinner, then his core identity is sin. And that's a direct contradiction, contradiction to Scripture, isn't it? Because believers are justified by faith. The implications of seeing yourself as a sinner are quite serious. For, after all, what do sinners do? They sin. What else would you expect of a sinner? Now, we're not saying for a second that believers never sin. We all do. We all live under God's amazing grace. But fundamentally, we are not sinners saved by grace. We are saints who sin from time to time. The organisation Alcoholics Anonymous has been enormously helpful to many people. And one of the fundamental principles they have is that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. And it's very good and admirable to admit, to take ownership and take responsibility for being an alcoholic. And I believe they start every meeting with the admission that you are an alcoholic. But having accepted responsibility for your substance abuse, AA has no belief that you can move on to something new. You remain forever an alcoholic. And that they do that so that it reminds you that you can slip off the trolley, you can slip into the abyss at any time. So thank the Lord that unlike that, having accepted and taking responsibility for being a sinner, that we can then move past that. We can move on to the next phase of being a saint. Now, when we sin from time to time, we don't have to go back like AA does into our past identity, we can stay connected with our new identity, with all the resources that has of forgiveness and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and Christian fellowship and prayer and worship and the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit, and we can overcome our sinful habits from a far stronger position, a far more nurturing perspective. As a saint, our will is now able to choose truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is truth which sets us free. Let's look at Ephesians 5.8. 
For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For many of us, you see, the issue is not is not we're not saints. It's that we do not live like the saints we are. If I use the football analogy, many of us are wearing the team Guernsey, but we aren't turning up to training or to the game. Food for thought. Let's finish as we started. Ephesians 1 said to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, and let's change that just slightly to, to the saints in Muck and Budin, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And similarly, we'll take something from the beginning of the letter to Corinth. To the church of God, which is at Muck and Budin, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Friends, if we believe in Jesus, we are saints by calling, sanctified in Christ Jesus. Let's finish in, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I renounce the lie that I'm just a sinner. I acknowledge that I'm a saint, not due to any effort on my part, but because of my redemption in Christ. I receive and take on my new identity in Christ as a saint, and I choose to do so by faith. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and enable me to live out of my true identity as a saint so that I may not sin. I choose to walk in the light, that I may glorify you. And I pray this in the wonderful name of my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So God bless you, the saints in Muckenbuden and all other places. Music